Hola, hola, bienvenidos al primer episodio de Insights, una serie en la cual platicamos con expertos de diversas áreas relacionadas con la salud para poder brindar un poco más de información relacionada con diferentes aspectos del bienestar. En este primer episodio tenemos al doctor Eric Pepper y es un episodio eh, que quise empezar con él porque creo que la plática que tuvimos refleja muy bien todo lo que quiero abordar a lo largo de la serie. El doctor Pepper es presidente de la Fundación Europea de Biofeedback y nos va a platicar sobre el impacto que puede tener la postura y la respiración sobre distintos aspectos de nuestra salud mental. El tema de este episodio es salud, un concepto holístico, puesto que a lo largo de toda la, la, de toda la charla que, que tuve con el doctor Pepper, pues estuvimos abordando un tema importante y este es que no podemos considerar a la salud mental como algo independiente de la salud física. Los invito a acompañarme eh, a esta entrevista y a que cualquier duda que pueda, eh, que pueda surgir me la, haya, me la hagan llegar a través de diversas redes sociales eh, que, que les voy a dejar todo en la descripción, así como los links que me pasó el doctor Eric Pepper. Nos va a platicar también del, del libro que publicó recientemente que se llama Tech Stress y bueno, eh, yo creo que va a ser una, es una charla que puede tener muchos este, datos interesantes para todos. Los invito a verla. Hello guys, thanks for joining us at Insights, a space to talk about neuroscience and mental health in order to provide you some information to make better decisions regarding your mental health. Today I'm very honored and proud to present Uh, a great professional in the area, Dr. Eric Pepper. Uh, let me let let me introduce it. Introduce him. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Eric Pepper is an international authority on biofeedback and self-regulation. Since 1970, he has been researching factors that promote healing. He is a professor of holistic holistic health studies at the Institute for Holistic held at San Francisco State University. He is president of the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe and past president of the Association for Applied Psychology and Biofeedback. He holds senior fellow biofeedback certification from the Biofeedback Cert Certification uh, International Alliance. He was the behavioral scientist, sports psychologist for the United States Rhythmic Gymnastics Team. He has a biofeedback practice at Biofeedback Health. He received the 2004 California Governor's Safety Award for his work on healthy computing. And in 2013, was received the Biofeedback Distinguished Scientist Award in recognition of outstanding career and scientific contributions from the Association for Applied Psychophysiology. He is an author of numerous scientific articles and books such as Make Health Happen, Fighting Cancer, a Non-Toxic Approach to Treatment, Healthy Computing with Muscle Biofeedback, and Biofeedback Mastery. He also recently published uh, a book called Textress, which he will be telling a little more about it uh, in the following minutes. He publishes the blog The Pepper Perspective, ideas on illness, health, and well-being. He is a recognized expert in holistic health, stress management, and works, workplace health, and has been featured on abcnews.com and in GQ, Glamour, Men's Health, and the San Francisco Chronicle, Shape and Women's Health. His research interests focus on self-healing strategies to optimize health, illness prevention, the effects of posture and respiration and learning self-mastery with biofeedback. So Eric, I'm, I'm very glad to have you here. How are you doing? Well, thank you so much for, uh, for just meeting on, on Zoom for today. Uh, I'm doing really well. I mean, you know, I live in Oakland, California, and the weather is gorgeously blue, and we are lucky that I can go outside. 
And part, what I often think about for health is that we need to also include our body and movement. So I'm lucky I can do movement and exercise. And when I think of our discussion mm -hmm. or the topic, what I really thought about is that mental health is so often seen, and I'm being totally unfair, as essentially anything that contains inside your head, your, your brain in a sense, that's mental health. Yeah. And in a, in a humorous joke, I used to say to my students, the psychologist takes, any, or the psychiatrist takes anything above the neck, the internist takes anything beneath the neck, and then the clergy take anything, the spiritual component outside, as well as the social worker in that sense. It's a major error, I think, in concepts mind, emotions, and body are really the same. They're interconnected totally. So a change in thoughts and emotions affect body, and a change in body affects mood and emotions. They're not separate. Now, obviously, we are in a, we are in a system, so we are not an separate we are contingent upon our environment, our families, our social connections. And we can see in COVID in the United States that the COVID sheltering in place or just being stuck more in the computer in front of it has caused an increase of a three to four fold increase in anxiety and depression. But also that it isn't just that we lack the social connections. It isn't just that we may have lost some jobs or, or get worried about the future. It's also, we're moving much less. Yeah. I mean, even for myself, and I, used to, I laugh, when I teach at San Francisco State, I used to leave my house, walk to the bar, that's our train or subway, you could say. And then I would walk from the last station to my university. And during the day at the university, I, I would walk. And I would walk about 13,000 steps. Since COVID, I walk 3,000 steps if I'm lucky, unless I purposely do exercise. Notice, before, to do body movement, it was just part of living. Yeah. Now... I have to use will. It's much harder to get something done by will. People sure. forget, and especially when you're depressed or anxious or have other issues, that we all demand almost the person has self-control, well, in a way, to say, I have to do it. And that is very hard for many people because it's much easier for me, which I will do later after, our, after this interview, I'm lucky, I already have an appointment with a friend of mine at 10 o'clock and they'll come. And even if I'm depressed, I'm luckily not too depressed, uh, mm -hmm. but even, and I don't feel like going out, that's more likely because, oh, it's just too much work to get up. But then my friend comes to my door with their mask on and then I will still go exercising and, and hike through the hills. And afterwards I feel so much better. And we forget how important that social connection is. Now, if it's okay, let me add one more piece. The other part that has shifted in the diet is that we're eating much more highly processed foods, yeah. which we know during COVID in the United States, the average American has gained seven and a half pounds this year. That is a disaster because that increases not just diet obesity, it increased the risk for diabetes, but also many of those kinds of foods change the human biome, which then reaffect your brain and your emotions. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, starting from from this part of seeing mental health, physical health, spiritual health, like they are in the independent of each other, right? But definitely, uh, what this cupboard has promoted is these changes that you've been talking to us about uh, starting from uh, the exposure to screens, uh, decrease an important decrease in movement and a decrease in, in social connections. This, the, when you were talking about movement, uh, I remembered an article that we published, uh, I think it was 2016, regarding incidental physical activity 
and the, the effect on cognition and the EEG. And this incidental physical activity is precisely the one that we are not able to, to have anymore, right? Correct. And the other part is, well, there, let me put, make it in two parts, but let me start the body. When I sit at the computer, most of us, without any awareness, start slouching. You yeah. know, we slouch. It's normal because when we slouch, we can sort of let ourselves hang loose. That means, you know, we're not, we have not much tension or we sit in the wrong position or especially if the laptop is, we're using a laptop, we have to look down or if our cell phone, we look down. But what people don't realize that body posture is a significant factor that by which we both communicate to others who we are, we make an opinion, and more, e even more important, that it's a factor which affects us. It's like a classical conditioned experience. What I mean by that, and, you know, and if, you're the, if you happen to be watching, do the following exercise for a moment. All you okay. do is just stand up. I don't know if you can see me or not. And all of you just stand up and then think for a moment, think of a memory. I'm going to get closer to the mic. Think of a memory when you felt really hopeless or helpless. They really defeated a time you felt totally defeated and take and, and take on that posture. You know, when you feel totally defeated and you know, you sort of collapse, you let yourself take on that posture, exaggerate that posture of defeat. Really, now in that posture of defeat, really evoke that memory. Really bring up that memory again. Make it as real as possible. Configure your body just with that. Okay, just keep doing that. Configure it. And get a sense how, what is happening. Now, I wanna shift, we can do this longer. Now, think of something that really was empowering. You really are positive. You know, it really worked, yay. And then configure your body in that way. So you're, you know, you really feel empowered. Everything is going your way. The world is looking up. Configure your body that way. And just stay there. And make that memory, now think of that memory, make it as, make, make it as real as possible. Like you really are there again. You can smell it. You're just there. The sense of sparkle you feel inside with that memory. And just keep doing that. And now, I like to reconfigure your body in that in the in now in the body of the feet once more. And now, while you're in this body of the feet, the somat, to hold it that way. Now you make the memory of empowerment, the memory, the joyful memory. Really evoke that one again and make it real. And just do that. Keep evoking that memory. And now shift. Make yourself in the empowered position once more. You know, the joyful, configure your body in a joyful way. And now evoke the, that memory of defeat. When it wasn't working. Keep evoking that. I think that's enough. We did it for a moment. I don't know what you experienced, but for most people, and see if that works for you and, and the listeners, when we configure our body, I would say in a sense of failure and defeat, and then try to evoke the positive memory, it was just harder to do and feel. And when you configure your body in the empowered position, it was harder to evoke and feel that hopeless memory. Did that work for you? For you? Yeah, yeah, it actually is. And uh, the transition is actually easier when you're adopting the uh, concordant, I don't know if that's a word, or <laughs> the concordant position or posture. Yes. And now you can see that that concept, I think, we have underestimated. 
So when I now sit at the computer and I start collapsing, now I get a negative thought or I have to do work or I can't finish my work or, you know, I go, I review, I, I get triggered by the argument with my wife or a partner or whatever. Then in this position, it, it quickly escalates and gets worse and worse and worse. And it's just harder to interrupt that. On, if I configure my body upright, it's a little easier to get out of that. And that led to one of our research studies with our students, which is really remarkable, which we published, in which we asked students simply to sit. And now evoke, and if you just sit and now you sit collapse, you can evoke easily negative memories. If you sit up, it's easier to evoke more positive affirmative memories. The question we want to ask is, which, how can we change our negative self-talk? Because a component of what many people have is that we either are always thinking of the failures in the past, and that is depression in a sense, mm -hmm. we, or we anticipating all the challenges in the future that's more like anxiety and we're not present. I'm yeah. exaggerating much too simplistically. But there is something like that. And then we ask the question, life gives difficulties. It does. If it didn't have challenges, you wouldn't be alive. Sure. So now think, think of a stressor in your brain. Think of that something stressful that gets you sort of down. In English, the word down, notice I'm getting down because by the stress. It's, the language supplies the body message almost. And now we think, evoke that. And now we did to split the group up in half and then we flip it back and forth. So it's a controlled study. And in one group, we just ask the people, think of it and now use cognitive therapy approaches to purposely change your language. The, I mean, the, the really the work that was based initially on the work by Aaron Beck and others, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the language, you change it, do it that way. That's one way. In the set, and then, we give them a few minutes. I know it's very quick, but I think it's really useful. And then you rate how much you felt better or worse, right? How easily it was to do this, how easy it was the negativity to let go away. And the second, the alternative strategy is what you did wherever you are. You do the same thing. You evoke that event, that negative language, really get, get involved into it. And then at that moment, you shift your body position, you sit up, you look up, you take a breath, let the breath go out, and then do the cognitive change. Mm -hmm. Uniformly, the people noted it was much easier. It's just really remarkable. It was so much easier to change that language. And if I looked at some quotes, it will take me one moment to get it. It was so impressive, and we published this article uh, but I guess last year or two years ago, it was, I was truly impressed how by combining body and posture, how much it changed, you know, it's all, it was all evoking, you know, and what people would we really say is the, some of the following phrases. Let me pull it up. I can give you the example. Well, here, I'll, let me flip. If you give me control of the screen for a moment, if that's possible. Okay. Well, the, this study then is where we had people either do co purely more cognitive therapy as a way to change their thinking very simplistically in a classroom or add body and breath to it. And this was an article that we published in Neuroregulation 2019 you know, it's collaboratively done with uh, Rick Harvey and Danny Amil from Tel Aviv. And our data really, it, to me, was very impressive. And it really anchored me in here what the data would be like. Let me get it. Here's transforming thoughts with posture to increase psychotherapy efficacy. I would say that, you know. And when people did you could see the effectiveness of reducing negative thoughts, anxiety, and tension. This is summed. 
the weighted posture, breath, and then the internal language change, you had much more efficaciousness than just language at the same time. Mm -hmm. It is so overwhelmingly impressive. You know, and, when, and if you look at the language that people would say in those moments, when you ask them, what was the difference? Because that makes it personal, not just 80, you know, many students. It's after right. changing my internal language, I still strongly felt the same thought. That was just a reframing way. But when they did the posture, breath, and reframing, I instantly felt better about my situation after adjusting my posture. You know? Yeah. You know, it is here. It's another one. Difficult, you know, in the reframing, difficult time changing language because we keep using the words, but our bodies almost are giving a signal. Wait a minute. You're still anxious. You're still depressed. My posture and breathing help, making it easy to change it. You know, when you look at these, it truly is impressive. And I, I completely am sort of saddened in a way that psychotherapy or even education therapists often, we sit in a chair and the patient sits back nice and relaxed, which is very nice because we want to develop this most critical issue of rapport but we collapse yeah but that posture implicitly if a, and it's only if a person has a history of more depression or hopelessness then that evokes without any awareness like classical conditioning the same state and we found this in an interesting way in a study with the students we did you know we did a study where we had students collapse like this, mm -hmm. then do mental math, subtract a number, let's say 13 from 874, 861, keep going backwards as quick as possible. And we did it in two positions, one collapsed, one erect, looking up. And then they flip it around so it's a balanced design. Unif essentially, it was much easier to do the mental math when they were sitting up and looking up. It was very impressive, even for people who are math majors. However, for the 20 to 30 percent of students who had also filled out, they had no test anxiety, no blanking out on the exam. You could say they're happy-go-lucky, they're not worried about anything. Posture made no difference. So if you have a history without worry, a history where you don't worry that you'll do good on the exam, a history where you, you don't blank out, then you could be lying down or you could be collapsed or standing upside down. On the other hand, if you had a history of depression, and so many people have moments or anxiety, am I going to pass this exam? Will I get this job? Then for those people, posture is a very powerful co-factor and i think the mechanism by which that works is probably more classical conditioning that in the past you know we collapsed well in the past we were defeated you can look at the athletes coming you know for the upcoming olympics some people will win and when they win they're like yay i won sure. and even after i've run their their marathon when they win all of a sudden they get an extra surge of energy they can run around the the track one more time, you know, and the person who, who loses, not all of them, because for some people losing is a win. I never expect to do so well, but for the one who feels defeated, you can just see their body go, Ugh. they slouch and collapse. If you yeah. have a history like that, then when you put your body in this position, it will evoke and trigger the memory, even without any words or pictures, but the same psychophysiological state that is associated with that kind of loss or depression, and then that amplifies. And I think us, that many educators or therapists forget the power of those conditioning moments. Yeah, which, which is terrible. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, 
uh, when you present the data of your of your research is is very clear and uh, both in the quantitative and the qualitative uh, reports and, and and definitely I think is uh, I don't know about uh, the states but in Mexico is is something that the typical psychology program or curriculum does not address uh, and that yeah and, uh, you know it's as if we still only compartmentalize the thoughts and emotions occurring here in yeah. our head it, it you know english english or probably spanish the same way is a language that makes that separation possible head body in english or brain yeah and really it's always connected an exercise i often do with people well i usually show it with biofeedback where i show skin conductance you have a thought of anxiety your skin reacts you, or we look at respiration patterns and we see them getting quicker or shallower so the person can observe that phenomena almost by discovery like an aha experience yeah and they know and believe it but if you don't do that there are still many tricks a therapist can do a classic old exercise i did with clients and students to show that mind really impacts body mm -hmm. And to show the power of that, of thoughts, is having people imagine a lemon. So I guide them through an imagery. So you sit quietly, then you imagine a big lemon in front of you, then you imagine cutting the lemon in half, then you imagine picking this lemon up, you get a glass, you squeeze this lemon juice into the glass, then you can hear the pits plop, you can feel the sprinkling of lemon juice against your skin. You know, then you put that half lemon down, you pick up the other half, you repeat that, really squeeze, feel the tightness in your arms, put it down. Then eventually you lift up the glass, bring it to your lips, feel the coolness of the glass against your lower lips, then just gently tilt the glass more, feel the, the lemon juice against your lips, now tilt it more, open your mouth, drink and swallow the lemon juice. And then you guide people through it in a kind of almost, you know, very, vivid visualization almost mm -hmm. everybody will have an increase in salivation okay. and then but that's and they they sort of don't think about it and then i point out you see the power of thoughts what you focus on is what you become look at your own language that's one part and in the same other way what we did earlier with the collapse you can say huh look how body affects thoughts and so they're not separate. So that gives yeah. us a broader perspective. Sure, yeah, then the, the relationship is uh, bi-directional. Yes. Yeah, it, it's Always. not a, a one-way street. Yes. And the final piece I think, which I think from the body side is useful. And I cannot easily do any of this often unless we do some very nice monitoring with physiology to show it, is the power of breath. That we really forget that breathing is intrinsic to our health cognitive and somatic and if you can learn to breathe more easily like a little baby where the stomach moves more when you inhale they allow the air to exhale it also supports when you breathe slower heart rate variability which means that you're balancing your sympathetic parasympathetic activity it also allows you time out to recenter because when we are stressed, our amygdala reacts milliseconds before our cortex. So we react before knowing. If I can become aware that way and then interrupt with breathing, it's like doing a timeout for yourself. It allows the brain to take charge again. And so often, so many of us in the middle of arguments, we say nasty things to somebody else. Even the, the people we deeply love, we say something that's really cruel and mean because we were captured by the amygdala. If for that moment we could interrupt, we would pause, step back and realize that basically everyone is just doing the best they can be doing. And if you can give them that credence, we wouldn't be as nasty so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, and I think this that you have just talked 
about is is really relevant because uh, I believe that uh, when we are uh, biofeedback providers or practitioners, we we rely or we learn to rely a lot on the on expensive equipment and very precise equipment. But one of the things that I have always admired a lot about you since I uh, before I met you, since I first read you, and then when I met you, is this ability to be able to provide examples with none of this uh, expensive, so precise equipment, right? Which maybe uh, any psychotherapist uh, may, may learn and, and uh, is very cost effective and start to implement in order to, to show people about this relationship? The way I often think about it is two ways. One, how can I set up a, an experience for a person, mm -hmm. even in the, in the therapeutic session, where they do something, they do, and then something else, and then they can compare. Then they can, are given the choice, ah, I experience, like we did earlier with the body posture one for a moment, I can do many others, I suspect, there are many others. You can have a choice. Now you, now the distinction is now you know versus believe it. We often believe something that that is not the key. The key is to know. If you've experienced, you know that it's real. Now you can act upon it. And so I recommend people to do experiences by which you can even make the symptom worse. That sounds not very nice for a month. And then do something else which the person habitually does by which they may get better. Then they can say, ah, there is a difference. There are many body or cognitive techniques you can do that with. In terms of the biofeedback, I think there are about three devices I often recommend. One is a simple measure of skin conductance. Mm -hmm. You know, just to show that mind-body connection or excessive arousal. You know, often I have used for many years with the athletes, we used a very simple GSR2 by thought technology or others. It makes no difference. You know, you can show hand warming with a very cheap thermometer. Yeah. In the fingers. Uh, we now do the posture feedback devices using something called the Upright Go, which is a little device that's an app on your cell phone. That one costs money. There's another one. I can send that to you, which uses the camera of your computer to tell you when you collapse. Oh, uh, that, that, that sounds great. So what we have done to go back is most people are unaware that, that, that their bodies are reacting, which really means their emotions and thoughts are reacting till it gets so uncomfortable or so joyous, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be negative, that you are aware. But when we are involved with each other, or when I'm involved at the computer, I'm really quite unaware that I'm reacting. Till at the end of the day, I either feel pain or tiredness. The key is not to wait that long. The key is to catch yourself before symptoms or discomfort occurs. That's both cognitive discomfort, emotional, and catch that way early, then we have the power to interrupt. It's if we wait too long, then it's very challenging to interrupt. It's sort of like when I'm tired, for if I'm depressed and I start feeling tired or depressed, sometimes a part of depression is just being tired. And if I can catch that first change, then it's possible to reach out to others. But once I'm very depressed, I cannot get myself to do anything. And then it takes my friends, family members, and others to give that social support and envelope to pull me up and take me for a walk. Yeah. And we forget that. And uh, it can and be about anything. So it becomes kind of an extrinsic uh, motivator, right? Yes. Uh, like a kind of scaffold to get you through. Uh, I, I know that you have uh, other, other appointments, Dr. Pepper, so, uh, I mean, I love talking to you, but I would like uh, before before we end, uh, if you could talk to the to the listeners a little bit about your new book, which I have read and I can recommend widely, as well as other books you have written. So, 
Uh, I know you have a great writing style, so I'd like for, for you to tell a little more uh, about it and where can they get it. Let me get me. Hold on. The book is called Tech Stress, How Technology is Hijacking Our Lives, Strategies for Coping and Pragmatic Ergonomics. And it partly came about that so many of us are looking at cell phones, looking at computers, at all kinds of screens. And for many of us, that act of doing that is that we are captured by the screen. We develop sitting disease. We don't even know what's happening. And at the end of the day, we feel more discomfort, etc. And our early work, in fact, which is described also in the book as exercise and practices, pointed out two or three things. One, we are unaware that we may be slouching, as I talked about before. We're unaware we're looking at the screen the whole time. So that for that biofeedback was a great way to show that to the people. And then we develop other practices so you can use awareness. The other part is that we have to see the human being in terms of our evolution. And let me give, we really forget that the reason I'm get captured by the screen, or if you have a child who's playing computer games, and the mother then calls and says, it's time for dinner, stop. The child will say, in a moment, and a half an hour later, the child is still captured. And then we blame the child for not having self-control, or we blame the adult for not having control to interrupt when they're working a move. Yeah. The key is, this is evolutionarily processed, because basically, when I'm looking at the screen, and I get new signals coming at the screen, new text, you know, I'm always responding or I go down into the rabbit holes of Zoom links or, mm -hmm. or any kind of links on Google or one other email or one other social media. They are, they, it activates those biological mechanisms which previously allowed us to survive. If I walked around in the jungle, I need to, you know, I need to look at something. If I see some change, I focus on it. That could be a dangerous person or a friend. Now, when I look at the screen, I have no choice. I just keep looking at it, especially yeah. when the screen captures me. You know, there are many more like that. Or I get captured before going to bed. I quickly want to check social media. Why do I want to do that, really? Well, from an evolutionary perspective, and I live in a clan of 150 people, I need to know the local gossip for survival. What is going on? Now it's very similar, we need, we, except we don't realize that. And so these are patterns which get so overactivated that they now become harmful for our lives. And so the book both describes the kind of background theory, the pragmatics, what happens when you sit at the computer? How can you sit more correctly in the right ergonomics? That means having the, the keyboard may be at the right height, the screen at the right height, so you're not slouching. Because when I slouch like this, the equivalent weight of my head is 60, 60 key pounds pulling on these muscles because it's forward. Yeah. We are unaware of that. But over time, by the end of the day, we're exhausted. Then it deals with the cognitive parts. And so it's really both background and hopefully it was to me, it was written so the user can really use the practices, the concepts, and promote a healthier life. Yeah, so yeah. So the book, like you said, he has the picture of it. It's my favorite book right now, Tech Stress. <laughs> I only wish somebody would write it and translate it to Spanish because then it would be great. Great, yeah. And, and, and I know this uh, evolutionary perspe perspective, sorry, the, the theoretical background, but uh, even more these uh, practical tips that the book has. I, I think it's very, very uh, enriching for, for people. And this provides a, like a baseline, right? For their, or, or to start with, to start maybe some, some changes in their office, in their homes. Uh, yes, uh, and we can do it ourselves. Life. Yes. I'll never forget when we first started to do this work. 
we encourage people to take small breaks because we showed that their muscle tension stayed up and by the end of the day, they had pain. And I'll never forget this one man who said, wait, I have no problems. I have no achiness. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to do it. Well, this is a group. We finally persuaded him to do it. You know, partly by peer pressure. Yeah. He, came back the, he came back the next week and he said, you know, there's life after five. And what he meant by that was when he did take these breaks at five o'clock, he had much more energy. He could live. But all he thought about before that he was unaware that he got basically tired by the end of the day. And by yeah. taking these short breaks, he didn't. There's a great program. I'll put that into the uh, chat as well. I should have done that earlier, I think. Called, it's called W. Yes, to clarify, uh, Eric means by not, uh, after five, because in the States, it's very common to follow this work schedules, right? From nine to five. Yes, I saw it. Yes, so he came to work at about eight o'clock in the morning. He left the university at five o'clock in the morning in the evening to go home. And by that time, he has finished his work day. And not that he had any pain, but he had no energy. Yeah, so, so you tend to maybe go and uh, watch TV until you go to sleep. And, uh, and you even tend to think that you have no time, right? Correct. And now all of a sudden he had much more energy when he left his work site. Yeah. A program we use, which is also free, which people can install on their laptops or computers, is called Stretch Break, www.stretchbreak.com. And you install that and it can remind you every 20 or 30 minutes to interrupt your process to stretch. Okay. Well, okay. I want to yes. thank you so much. I would just like to uh, remember uh, the listeners that you also have a, a blog that is also full of very interesting and, and practical information. And uh, the last post was on uh, regarding the year uh, Faraday in the, in the own bedroom and some uh, advice on, on certain plans. So uh, Dr. Pepper has a lot of of excellent insights regarding health. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you very much for, for having accepted, for having taken time out of your busy life to, to talk a little about our, uh, your work and your knowledge to our listeners and for everything really. Maurizio, thank you so much, it's a pleasure. I'm sorry I was not there in person. It would be so much nicer to be there. Next yeah. time. We'll have time in the future. Yes. Well. So each, stay healthy, go outside, at least get some sunlight to get vitamin D. Sure. And to be healthy. Enjoy. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Pues bueno, espero que hayan disfrutado de esta charla con el Dr. Pepper y tanto como yo. Los invito a seguir mis redes sociales que están en la descripción para que estén enterados de todo lo que pasa con Insights, eh, para que se enteren semana con semana de los invitados que vamos a tener y para que además tengan un canal mediante el cual nos podamos comunicar, eh, podamos resolver dudas, etc. También, eh, pues si te gustó la entrevista, te invito a, a darle like, a compartir y a suscribirte al canal para que siempre estés enterado del momento en el que salen nuevos episodios. Los espero el próximo lunes con el estreno del episodio número 2, en el cual vamos a platicar con el doctor Vicente Caballo de la Universidad de Granada. Saludos y hasta la próxima semana. Bye.